Hello, folks. Um, thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. Um, my name is John Cooper. I'm from the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies of the University of Exeter. Um, as the, um, I'm from the Center of Islamic Archaeology as well, all of which might make you wonder why on earth um, I'm talking to you about the Saxon fishweir um, in Hampshire. But um, I'm very happy to be doing so. As I say, this is not my normal stomping ground. My, my presentations normally begin, begin with um, images of um, beautiful golden beaches and palm trees and fabulous um, boats of the Western Indian Ocean, but not on this occasion. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today um, is um, this particular find in the intertidal zone of um, near Ashlet in Southampton Water. Um, and what I'll do is, first of all, I'll just give you a little introduction to the um, Ashlet, Ashlet um, Saxon Fishweir site. Um, I'll, what I'll spend most of the time um, talking to you about is examining its uh, construction, um, the materials, the dating, etc. Um, but then I'll go on to make some uh, morphological and chronological um, comparisons um, round about Northwest Europe, particularly um, Britain, Ireland, and the Channel area. Um, and then uh, briefly, um, the Saxon world is not my area of, of expertise. I'm much more um, somebody of the Abbasid world, which was contemporary with it, but I'll try to settle it, set this a little bit into the context of Saxon Hampshire. And then at the end, I'll kind of look at the processes of landscape change that have been going on around this um, fish weir, which kind of led to us discovering it in 2005 and um, are ongoing and there is a lot of change going on at the site and um, you know and, and obviously this has implications for the future. Okay so let's just um, situate us here we are um, on the south coast of England um, and zooming in here we have the little um, hamlet of Ashlet which you can see is at the southern end of Southampton Water on the western side where you can see hamp written that is pretty much um, the new forest um, so you can you can see Southampton to the north Portsmouth to the east some of you will know this very very well indeed but um, I don't know on, on, a, on a presentation like this where everybody's from so that is where we are we're in the middle of the south coast of southern England um, at a tiny little hamlet hamlet called Ashlet okay so um, let's just zoom in a little bit further and look on an OS map, which I've annotated with some extra stuff. And here we have um, the site um, marked, oops, what happened there? Sorry, the site marked here. Um, you can see that little sort of upturned um, L shape there. Those are the fishery structures. As you can see there in the, um, the mud flats, just below areas of salt marsh, um, this is an ecologically um, a very, very important area. Um, it falls within the height, the Calshot Marshes um, site of special scientific interest. I believe it's also a Ramsar site, and it's also part of the Solon Special Protection Area. Um, just to the um, west, as I've already said, is the New Forest as well. So it's a really, really important area for wintering and migrating birds. So a lot of ecological importance there. And yet at the same time, a glance at this um, map shows you um, that it's also a very, very industrial area. You can see that the east side of this map is pretty much dominated by the Foley oil refinery, which is the largest oil refinery in the UK. Um, there's also um, petrochemicals facilities there as well. As you can see that the jetties and um, the loading jetties, etc., stretching out into Southampton water. Just to the south of the fishery structures, we've got Foley Power Station, now defunct. I believe it's going to be developed into housing. Just to the north of Foley Power Station, we've got an area that's now abandoned that I think had something to do with um, wartime loading. There are lots of kind of concrete aprons and things there. Um, and then you've got Southampton Water itself, which of course is um, this hugely important um, shipping lane. So it's all going on around this fishing structure, both on an industrial and on an ecological um, basis. Um, just to um, now give you a little bit of an 
um, a direct impression of the site. Um, this is just a little bit of drone footage, a flyover of the area um, taken by um, Fraser Sturt. Um, thank you, Fraser, um, during a 2016 visit to the site. Um, as you can see, you can see lots of mud flats, those kind of scoring lines you can see on the mud just below the drone are um, from cockle dredging. In the background, you can see the big orange ship of the refinery loading jetty. Um, you can see vessels moving up and down the channel. Um, you can see these two handsome chaps walking across the mud. You can see it's actually, it's relatively firm. We're not going down to more than our ankles there. Um, when we first visited this site in 2005, it was a much muddier picture, which is just the first indication of change. You can see the, rain, the raised shingle bank at the back there that we're just backing away from. The weir site is just in front of it. So we're now moving backwards across the, um, across the um, mud flats below um, the, the um, area of salt marsh. As we retreat, um, you'll begin to see kind of softening mud which is erosion from the, um, from the salt marsh cliff. We're beginning here to enter into Ashlet Creek a little bit. Um, here you can start to see the softer mud and the kind of runnels as it runs down from the salt marsh cliff, which is just coming into view now. Um, on top, it's a very, very erosional here. On the top here, you can see all of that shell as well, that white shell, which are these kind of, um, Shelly Cheniers, I believe geologists call them, Chenier fans, that kind of help to create scour and, and accelerate the erosional situation. We didn't really see these in 2005. More about that later, but hopefully you can you get from that a general overview of the site um, and the area. Obviously, the, um, the, the weir itself didn't show up because it's not, um, it's not visible from the air or, or barely from the ground, to be perfectly honest. So, a little story about um, the discovery. Um, we found this, um, we are not as part of what you might call a structured coastal survey. At the time I was a mature student doing a master's degree in maritime archeology span at the University of Southampton. And my fellow MA students and I, a group of us were actually looking for a, a Southampton flying boat. The, re the remains of which somebody in a pub somewhere had told us were to be found in the area. And to be perfectly honest, we were kind of blundering around trying to find this thing. Um, the light was falling, the tide was coming in. Um, and just before we beat a retreat from the, um, from the foreshore, um, we came across this line of stumps, um, which you can see in front of us. At the time, they were kind of, well, you can see that's probably about 10, maximum 15 centimeters. They were um, raised above the, the mud thereabouts. It was a lot muddier in those days. And we soon found that just after a few times walking up and down this structure, we were beginning to kind of excavate a trench along the side of it. And that kind of prompted us to change our behavior very quickly around the site. So that's the, that's the story of it. Um, it's discovery. We came back the next day or the next time there was decent light and the correct tide um, and a more comprehensive um, investigation revealed the structure that you can see in front of us now. So what we've got in the foreground highlighted in yellow is this circular catchment area called a pound. Um, it's about three and a half meters across. Um, you can see just to the bottom left there, there was a solitary post there highlighted in blue, which we believe was some kind of anchoring base that maybe had uh, ropes or a, a kind of a bracing post um, running up to it. Both are possible. Inside, you can't really see it in here. There were also two posts within the, um, within the circle, um, which probably held some kind of no return device. That'll probably become clearer on the plan when I show you it in a moment. And then we've got, you can see them quite clearly in yellow, running off to the left and running off to the right. We've got two lines of kind of densely placed posts. And these um, constitute the two leaders of the weir. Um, so obviously, I mean, I don't know how well you'll know is you've got to extrude all of these features up as posts and fences. And so you've got two leaders which are directing the fish. We've got our back to the open um, Southampton water here, directing the fish 
steering them into the catchment pound, which is where they're caught. In the background there, you can also see an area that's highlighted in pink. This was a much more nebulous set of posts that um, we've speculated about, but we haven't done any dating on them. Um, the structures are not quite so um, apparent as to what they are, but they're there as well, and we'll, we'll, we'll move on to them as well. We'll address them during the course of the presentation. We believe basically that they may have been some kind of frames for holding fish trap baskets, put baskets, but we're, but we're, but we're not sure about that. So of course, what we did, um, we went ahead and we did a total, survey, a total station survey of the site. Um, and this is pretty much um, what we came up with, um, something which is um, quite um, apparently and quite obviously a fish weir. So you can see the round pound there. You can see two posts within it, which we believe um, would have had um, some kind of um, wattle barriers running to them. And that would have been the kind of no return, voice, uh, no return device that would have prevented fish from backing out of the, of the, of the um, pound area. Then we've got the northern um, leader, so-called, running for um, just under 30 meters northwards, but where it stops, it kind of headed under, un it, it went underneath a kind of a, a shelly um, ridge, the one that we could see on the drone imagery. And therefore we think this is maybe, not, probably not, possibly not its full extent, it may be buried um, under, that, um, under that feature. The Western leader was really quite interesting. As you can see, it continues out from more or less the same distance as the Northern leader. As you can see, the structure of the Western leader and the Northern leader and the pound in terms of the post arrangement is fairly similar. They're quite closely set together. They're probably about 45 centimeters apart, a sort of a cubit, an arm span um, each apart. And so very, very um, uniform in feature. Along the western leader, we found um, bits of bits of wattle, um, and then we had this gap, um, and it's a, it's quite a, a substantial gap of off the top of my head about 20, uh, 20 meters thereabouts, um, and thereafter th the line of the western leader resumes. But what kind of confounded us early on was the fact that it, it resumed, but at, at this point it was a different um, structure. There was a post every roughly four, four and a half meters, and in between there was plenty evidence of wattle um, run in between them, but, but no other posts. Um, we'll talk more about the wattle structures in the two parts of the Western Extension and the Western Leader earlier on, but this kind of raised this question to us, are we actually looking um, at the same structure or two structures that just uh, happen to be aligned but were erected in chronologically different periods, one with reference to, to the other. Um, we, we just didn't know. It was, it was a bit of a mystery to us. And then you can see in the, um, in the center, that area that we've marked quite um, confidently on this plan, um, fish trap frames, but actually um, we're not at all um, convinced or, should, you know, that, that's still an open question and maybe, maybe we should have a question mark um, after that. Okay, so that's just another view of the Northern Leader. Um, I think I've probably said all I need um, to say about that before we move on. If you can see the, the kind of tiny speckles along the Western Leader, they were where we took points where there was wattle. So that just shows you a little bit of um, an indication of the extent of the wattle to be found. We really didn't find very much around the Northern Leader nor around the Pound either. Okay, so that's just looking in. I know we've lost the scale, but we've seen the original map. So um, just just to show you the 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 western extension, we've got these well strung out posts with these long runs of wattle in between of perhaps you know four and a half five meters, which was a bit of a mystery to us. Clearly, this it, it looked it all looks a bit flimsier when you're thinking about it in terms of tidal movement and the pressures that the sea can um, impose. So this was a bit of a question for us, why this difference and what on earth did it all mean? Okay, and there's just a, a close up on that area of um, fish traps. What, um, there, there's certainly, there's a lot of sort of higgledy piggledyness going on there, but then there's also some detail as well, especially, um, especially towards the bottom right. I mean, we can see there is structure there. We can see there are lines 
we can see there are posts maybe arranged in fours, but then there are obviously loads more posts. Um, and then something happening on a trajectory, which is kind of from the bottom right up to the top left as well. So, so all a bit mysterious. We're kind of speculating that maybe we're looking at some kind of um, put frame arrangement, not necessarily a whole weir. It might have been a lot, a lot more constrained than that, but you know, something of this nature. But as I say, this is the kind of nebulous and um, less clear part of what we um, found. So in addition to um, actually um, surveying, we also, at the time in 2005, um, lifted a small number of the posts really um, for the purposes of examining um, the tool marks on the end. And um, this was the longest um, post that we um, removed. It's more than a meter long. Um, and you can see um, quite large, very, very sharply cut um, tool faces on a on a spire pointed post. Um, the other end, you can see the, the you know the, probably about the top 15 centimeters of it, it was out of the mud, and the rest of it was was under the mud. Um, yeah, what this kind of this was all a bit mysterious. This one's very very f deeply into the mud, you know, by 1995 centimeters or something, suggesting that we're maybe not very far away from the original. Um, sort of ground level of the weir at the time it was constructed, but that doesn't really follow all the way through because other posts, this one on the northern leader, were barely still in the in the ground. I mean, this is the you know this had about um, 22 centimeters in the ground. This particular one, again, you, though you can see the pretty pretty large tool mark faces, um, which was the only indication that we had, the kind of only suggestion that we had about the age of the of the thing of this uh, of the weir of the structure of this site simply because they were quite large and obviously um metal which is not that much of narrowing it down that much um here's another post this post was um removed oh i didn't put a caption there um this post was removed from the area of the um the put frames or, or the, the trap frames and as you can see generally here the the tool marks are very very much smaller which made us wonder at the time whether this was indicative of a of an of a different perhaps a much earlier um phase um, but actually, we also found posts from that area that had been sawn as well. So this just kind of adds to the further mystery, really, of that um, whole area. Let's just look at the wattle, because the wattle was quite interesting um, in this respect. Here we are in this image looking at the, um, the western leader, the, the kind of part of the core fish weir, the part that's nearest to the pound. And this is the kind of wattle that we were seeing there. The, the, the key thing to observe is the fact that what we had were single sails visible um, on the kind of upslope side of the posts. So um, yeah, with, with rods woven in between them, what this suggests is, was, was n unlike some ethnographic examples we've seen, that the that the um, the rods weren't woven around the posts, but they were perhaps hurdles that were created off the off the foreshore and then brought in and and tied into place um, subsequently. If we compare this to the western extension, so that part that continued the the, the fish weir after that long gap, we came across wattle with a different structure, and this wattle essentially rather than just having single sails, the sails, by the way, are the vertical parts of a wicker hurdle, yeah? So instead of having single sails, it had double sails. Um, they were slightly further apart, but I think the fact that it had double sails seemed to suggest that this was investing um, the, the, the um, wattle structure with a lot more um, strength. And given that these were um, slung between posts that were, you know, four, four and a half, five meters apart, that would make um, quite a lot of sense. Um, on both cases, um, the hurdles were laying on the on the upstream side of the posts, and that makes quite a lot of sense because in the Solent, the ebb tide tends to be twice as fast as the flow tide, and therefore you'd be getting greater pressure when the tide was going out. Adding to that, of course, you might also have the weight of debris that's being washed out at the same time. So, um, so there we go. That's a, a little view of the um, wattle situation. Let's just sum some of that information up in a table. 
um, we took three um, timbers from the Western leader. Um, what we saw in terms of tooling there were either saw marks or use of a very large bill hook. Um, in the area of these fish trap frames, we were seeing either saw marks or the use of a very, very small bill hook. Um, and then during the 2016 visit, when we extracted three posts for um, carbon-14 dating and species identification, again, we came uh, up with evidence of a kind of, of, the, of the use of a, a large um, bill hook. So um, some kind of consistency there across the, um, the main fish weir structure and difference from the put frames. Um, in terms of species identification, the ones that we did in the lab, they were all um, oak. Um, I've already indicated the, the information there about the tooling. But um, in addition to, to um, <clears throat> the species identification of the wood as oak, we also, at the time of the 2005 um, field work, we also saw posts that really looked as though they had birch bark around them. So maybe there was more than one um, species of timber being used um, across the weir, which wouldn't be particularly surprising, I would say. Okay, so we did do the um, carbon-14 dating um, in 2016, and this is um, very excitingly what came up. Um, we're talking about um, dates from broadly the Middle Saxon period, um, which is which was obviously a, a very very exciting um, result for us. Um, and also we've, we have we took the um, post identifications in the wood, which I've already told you about. So that was that was the dating. One post from the Western leader, one post from the pound itself, and one post from the Northern leader. So um, focusing our resources pretty much on um, carefully um, getting confirmatory dating about the actual, um, the, um, the core weir rather than the peripheral items. Um, so anyway, where does that put us? We now have a Saxon fish weir. Well, here's a little map which um, pins um, v various um, contemporary features in Britain and Ireland. Um, obviously, the, 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 the British ones, the Southern English ones, Welsh ones are more kind of um, salient. What we find is that we've got quite a lot of Saxon ear equivalent um, fish weirs in um, the big estuaries of the south of England, the Severn, the Thames, the Blackwater estuary, as well as um, the Shannon and Strangford Loch in Ireland. But to date, the only ones that we've found that have been found with a round pound, they're all concentrated in the um, Solent area. Two of them on the Isle of Wight at Binstead. The Binstead one is pretty much exactly contemporary with the Ashlet one and the Springdale one, which is kind of late Saxon, early um, Norman in date. And that, that shows a kind of, you know, it starts to ask questions. Are we seeing some kind of regional um, vernacular appearing around the Solent area? And I believe that um, um, Therese has been working with the Chichester and District Archaeological Society, and I think they found some um, interesting um, features in their area as well, which suggest there may be more to come and kind of confirming this kind of pattern in um, the Solent area, which is very, very exciting to hear. Um, so let's look at um, what um, <clears throat> sort of ethnographic comparators we have to this. Well, the first thing we came across was this rather um, lovely image from the um, Traité Général des Pêches um, by Duhamel du Monceau from the 18th century. And here we can see <clears throat> a configuration which is very similar um, to what we've seen at um, Ashlet, a round pound, extending into the pound to create some kind of no return valve, if you like, and then the two leaders heading off up to the um, up the shore. Diminishing in height, interestingly, this is confirmed in the text, not just in the image, as, as it moves further up the, 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 the slope of the shoreline, which is not at all um, surprising. Um, more recent work, however, has revealed um, in France also, in Normandy, has revealed some very, very interesting comparators. And here um, we have a, um, a fish weir on the left-hand side, the photograph, a family fish weir at Haute-Ville-sur-Mer, operated by the Le Peur family, father and son, in Normandy in 2004. And um, this is really terrific work that's been done by um, Biard and colleagues 
um, in uh, Normandy and thereabouts in the last um, few years. And not only do we have a round pound, not only do we have this kind of, you know, all this ethnographic evidence of how it operates, um, but also if you look in the photograph and in the diagram, we also see a change in the nature of the of the leader as we move away from the pound. In the in the case of the Normandy examples, the change happens very much more quickly. Um, after you know, in terms of distance from the pound, in the Ashlet one, the, the change seems to happen much further away. But nevertheless, we get a move away from something which is taller and stronger and denser to something which is kind of more loosely woven, particularly in its upper height. I'm not saying they're the same; they're clearly not. But this idea that two different two different um, techniques could be applied along the same leader is obviously pertinent to the ashlet. We, as you can see in this image, there were kind of stone footings around the bases of the posts. We didn't see any of that at ashlet, um, but that um, doesn't mean there weren't any originally. <clears throat> So just zooming in a little bit and looking and considering that image, I think um, what's also interesting about this, obviously there are there were no tractors in the Saxon era, but you know this image gives us some idea of the kind of activities that the weir would have attracted. It's interesting that even at low tide, we can see the area around the weir is still in water around the um, pound area. Um, this would have kept the catch in water at all times. Um, nevertheless, I think collectors would have had to be in present at every low tide um, to fend off seabirds, to fend off poachers, and also, uh, you know, something about a structure like this, once it's up and running, it's up and running, and it will be catching fish whether or not you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're present. And so kind of community, it implies, a, a structure like this kind of implies a community vigilance and a constant tending of it um, in order to um, derive the, the maximum benefit from it. Okay, so um, what about its Saxon context? Um, well, um, Ashlet is a is a Saxon name, meaning the, the kind of fast fast watering, fast moving stream um, of of the ash trees, um, and the nearby church at Forley is also Saxon. None of which is is particularly surprising. The weir is also contemporary with the he the heyday of of Hamwick. Um, Saxon Southampton. Um, there are also this evidence roundabout of, of, of sultans, although these haven't been dated. Um, but of course, you know, if, if they were contemporaneous, then you could have salted fish moving um, quite a distance um, inland as well as moving up and down the um, Solent itself in Southampton water. Who would have owned a weir like this? Well, very much the, the sort of larger weir complexes that we see around the country um, are often associated with ecclesiastical institutions, of which there were um, a number in the region. <clears throat> but smaller ones, as O'Sullivan observes, um, were often and sometimes associated um, simply with, with more, more local communities, albeit local communities that had access to the kind of timber resources to build and maintain a structure like this one. <clears throat> Okay, so let's think about um, the landscape in which we find it and what might have um, been going on um, in sort of, well, what has been going on in recent decades, let's say. If we, on the left-hand side of this image, you can see a fairly panned out um, satellite view um, of the area. You can see Calshot Spit there. You can see um, the power station down below. Um, the fish weir is there in pink. Um, if we zoom down on the, you, it's a close-up basically on the right-hand side, and what you can see better on the right-hand side, um, what we did was we took um, the various um, ordnance survey data um, from I think the earliest is 1898, and plotted this, overlaid this onto the satellite imagery, added also our own surveys of the cliff extent as well as the cliff extent apparent in this imagery itself, and what this shows very very clearly is that since 1898 and maybe before, um, we've had this kind of process of consistent retreat of the salt marsh and um, moving backwards and backwards um, towards the high water mark um, during this period. So we've, we've basically got a situation of erosion. What this also shows us is that the area in which we find the fish weir 
would have been completely covered by salt marsh until sometime between the survey that created the 1962 Ordnance Survey Map and the survey that created the 1974 Survey Map. Um, so that's when, at a certain point, the, um, the, the, the salt marsh cliff would have eroded back and eroded back, given way to the mud flats and then the kind of the, the, the muddy foreshore since that time until 2004-05 when we found this fish weir um, would have been a situation of kind of erosion. And, you know, we were seeing wooden posts with evidence of kind of um, gribble and deterioration in the water column showing that they, you know, they hadn't been exposed, they were being exposed and they were being kind of um, eaten away as they were exposed as well. So a sense that really this was all a fairly recent process that we were um, uh, encountering here. What this means, um, obviously it tells us something about the story of the erosion since the um, late 19th century, um, but it also tells us that there must have been a degree of salt marsh progradation taking place since the Saxon era, at some point after the abandonment of the fish weir, um, until some point, oops, sorry, I've just moved forward unintentionally, yeah, um, so until some point, um, you know, before or around 1898. Um, of course, this might not have happened in, in a single kind of ebb and flow, there might have been lots of pulsations, but um, the fish weir, the, the salt marsh must have been pretty far back in the Saxon era to enable a fish weir to um, operate at this time. So all very interesting insights, not just for um, the, the kind of history of the um, weir, but also for the development of the entire salt marshes in the surrounding area. What the US maps also showed us, which was um, very, very interesting, this is a detail, very, very zoomed in and hence fairly pixelated, of the 1898 Ordnance Survey map overlaid onto the Weir site. And what we can see is that this kind of, this kind of fork channel, um, this drainage channel within the salt marsh is blasting right through the very gap that we'd found when we surveyed the fish map, the fish weir. So presumably here we have an explanation of why that gap is there. At some point, um, th this channel cut its way through and washed away the posts between, the, between those two points. And I think it's, it's rather um, neatly illustrated by that image. Okay, so um, what, in the light of all this, is the um, prognosis for the site? Well, I um, visited the site again with colleagues from Southampton University in 2016 for the sole purpose of um, getting some posts for the carbon-14 dating and the um, species identification. And I was really, this was the first time I'd been there for um, 11 years or so, and I was just absolutely blown away by the changes that had taken place. There was a huge amount of additional erosion had taken place. There was a lot more shelly material up on top of the salt marsh cliff and also over the um, the, 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 the uh, mud flats themselves, which was um, which was a really really um, big surprise. It actually, I, I think, without um, GPS points, I really would have struggled to find the fish weir at all. Um, so what's going on? Well, there are lots of factors, um, including ongoing sea level rise, um, the dieback of salt marsh plants. Changes to the sedimentary budget induced by the dredging of Southampton water for ever larger ships. There was an, a, a big episode of that just in the last decade or so. Um, on the um, top of the salt marshes, we're seeing the expansion, the expansion of these shell chenier fans where you get these very broken bits of shell, which once there is no vegetation beneath them can scour very, very quickly into the mud. And I think in these photographs, you can kind of see and get the sense of the erosion um, taking place. Other factors are the kind of coastal squeeze situation you get um, when you build hard sea defenses to the landward. And for example, around the power station and the refinery, both of which when they were constructed uh, earlier in the 20th century involved the expansion of the foreshore um, and the reclamation, if you like, of land um, from the salt marshes, which must also have had an impact. 
So really, really dramatic changes. And I think it's fairly obvious when you look at that. When we went back to the fish site, into the fish weir site in 2016, and eventually uh, found it, the there was no wattle um, apparent. The number of posts were, were far, far fewer. Now, whether that was because they'd been lifted up and washed out or dragged out by um, cockle dredging, or um, whether it was because they were buried, it was it was it was quite hard to tell. But certainly, there has been very very significant um, change going on. So um, that pretty much tells the story. I think I'd just like to um, acknowledge my um, dear friends and colleagues um, from the MA course in 2005 who got the ball rolling on this entire um, project. Um, all named there, all co-authors on the publication that eventually came out. Um, so in summary, really, um, this is a really, really fascinating, I think, and compelling um, find, even if it isn't in the warm tropical waters that I'm, uh, that I'm used to. Um, it tells us something about coastal resource exploitation methods um, in Saxon, Hampshire. Um, but it's also a hugely effective datum point in the landscape that can tell us a great deal about sea level, about shoreline change, about salt marsh change in the past um, 12, 12 centuries. So I hope um, that is an indication really of not just the value of this site, which is all very nice, but the kind of information really that, that these um, really interesting and very, very specific points within the foreshore landscape, what they can tell us about landscapes of the past, of the present, and um, perhaps also of the future. So if you are interested in finding more, we've already published this in the Journal of Maritime Archaeology in 2017. So all um, information is there. There's also a pretty con, con um, what's the word, comprehensive um, survey of fish weir sites um, around um, Northwest Europe. Um, which may be useful to anybody as a starting point if you are working on a site um, yourself. So um, really all there is to say, that, sorry, that is the um, that is the <coughs> slide to tell you about the publication. Finally, acknowledgements to my own institution for ultimately funding the um, Carbon 14 dating um, during my uh, master's period for the supervision that came from John Adams and the Center for Maritime Archaeology and these other kind folk who advised and helped in various ways um, along the process towards publication. So yes, thank you um, to them and thank you to you all for listening. <clears throat> I'm just about to lose my voice. So um, yes, thank you very much, and um, I'm ready for questions if there are any. John, while we're waiting, just the um, I love the ethnographic comparisons that you've shown there, which are you know as recent as 2004, and yeah. it's amazing because it teaches us so much. I think not about not just looking at the morphology of something, because um, as you mentioned, I've been out with the Chichester and District Archaeological Society looking at a very similar structure in East Head in Chichester Harbour. And you would immediately think, well, it must be Saxon because it looks exactly the same as John's example. But there we are, 2004, and uh, still being used by family. Yeah, yeah. Did you meet with those folks? Did you manage to? Um, are this no, no, this is all work from BIA, which came out actually quite a long, I mean, came out after our initial survey. Um, there was a big gap, really, where I didn't do anything with this material because I I, I was doing other things, and um, I need I you know eventually I got some funding and then got the dating, and when it was confirmed as Saxon, that's when I got excited and wrote the article and and did all the research, and it was kind of in that intervening period that all this amazing, really really amazing ethnographic research has come out of um, of France of France by Biard and um and others and it's just really rich and yeah it was just to, to see those photographs and think what 2004 that's amazing um yeah because i think and there then are all these the same... so i was just going to say these tantalizing links you know that um that the, there's kind of historical evidence that the monasteries of mont saint michel had um had fish weirs in the southern coast of England, you know. So are you thinking is there some really really long term connection between this kind of style of making fish weirs, or is that just a completely random coincidence? Both of which, of course, are possible. Indeed. Uh, mm. So we've had a little set of questions come in, um, and the first one was, "What was the weir survey you mentioned?" Um, that's from David. I'm not sure, David, which weir survey in particular. 
Uh, if you could specify, if you could come back to us, David, on that one. Um, yeah. And Mark um, Seaman from, I know, CDAS, hi, Mark, is wondering what the shingle bank, was the shingle bank natural or man-made? It looked very much, it looked natural. I think it was probably related somehow to the outfall of Ashlet Creek. I'm not a geologist, but I always speculated that that's what it was about. Um, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It was just that bit further away that we, we had very little time on the site. I mean, in terms of when we went there on a particular day, we knew we had a little window to get the work done and do the survey. Um, and so we really focused on the site. We really focused on the recording of the posts and we didn't wander that far. Um, beyond that bank, it just, um, it was very, very close to the lowest point of the tide and we didn't really investigate a lot in that area. There's, there's still more to be done on the wider landscape. We say it's erosional, so there must be other material, presumably other material eroding out. Um, and we never got to the bottom of those structures in the middle either. So there's still plenty of work to be, if they still exist, there's still plenty of work to be done at the site. Well, the level of erosion is um, quite alarming, isn't it? Do you have any plans yeah, to really? go back? Uh, None, none. I mean, apart from to go and look at it fondly, um, in terms of research, <laughs> we don't have any, we don't have any plans. Well, give us a call when you go to look at it. We'll, we'll come and ogle yes, it. Yes, I'd, I'd love to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Stephen also, who I know is a member of CDAS, is wondering if they um, could have come in pairs or more than one. And I know that you do talk about this in your publication. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you see somewhere like the Blackwater Estuary, um, there are a whole series of these things. And I think um, the people who surveyed that counted something like 13,000 posts. Um, and you do see whole arrays of them in Cleethorpes, somewhere in Liverpool Bay, I think in in, in um, the Severn estuary as well. We didn't see any more. And I, I don't know, my, my hunch, and it's nothing more than a hunch, is that because this fish weir sits at the mouth of Ashlet Creek, um, which is a relatively small thing, um, that maybe there wasn't that much room for others within that creek area i don't know whether that makes any sense or not but um yeah that was, I think that that was, was pretty my... small outflow happened it, compared to yeah the... exactly and um, I, I kind of think the fact that we was there it was related to that outflow they were somehow um you know that was the reason they'd put it there so i mean there are historical records of weirs further up at dibden um, I think from the medieval period, there's a, um, a mention of a monastic institution within Southampton itself having fish weirs at Dibden. So there, there were others around the place. Um, another question this time from Jeremy is, uh, Jeremy's wondering how many fish do you think the weir caught each year? Do you know, I have ne I, I've always um, wondered about this. I've always, I don't even, I'm, to be honest, I, I sometimes think I don't even know what species they were catching um and yeah I, yeah this is i think a kind of can we do experimental archaeology can we build um can we build fish weirs in the uk are they allowed i don't know but um but that would be a very very fascinating um and very very useful thing to do really would to um build a fish weir and see what happens that would be amazing but we could or maybe i don't know if the i haven't looked at the ethnographic studies myself but they might have some indication or give some indication of well they're french i know but um, yes, the, 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 if, if, if you're okay with the French, there, there's plenty of information, um, there's plenty of information of, of kind of types of catch. I don't know about quantities, but types of catch in those areas. The French ones seem to be much bigger than this, I think, ever was, however. Um, and Edward is asking, he says, John, great talk. The round pound concentration in the Solent area is interesting. Are there any parallel concentrations from Saxon times on the continent, which might link to other associations of the Saxon kingdoms with the continent? Um, I'm not aware in the published literature of Saxon era sort of equivalent um, weirs in, in Normandy or Brittany, but I know there has been a lot of survey work done and quite a lot found. I just don't know whether they've been dated or um, published. So don't know the answer to that one. And the next question from Marcus is, um, are there any other fish traps known in Southampton Water or the New Forest area, you know? Known to me, no. no. And um, in terms of publications, uh, I, I haven't seen any. So um, there are the two over on the other side in, um, in, in, on, on the Isle of Wight. Um, but, but apart from that, no. 
I think at the time I was was the only one actually on the south coast of mainland England, if you like. That was our proud (laughs) boat. If if you're not out in the foreshore in the right conditions, you could so easily miss these things. So I'm sure. Oh, that was completely missable. I think if if we hadn't been looking for a a Sunderland flying boat on that day, this thing might never have, um, you know, it might never have been seen. We might have just been there on a day when it was particularly exposed and particularly visible. Um. Mark, hello, Mark. Uh, I assume that there are no weirs still in use around the UK. No, as far as I'm, I mean, they they operated until very, very recently. Maybe somebody else can contribute and correct me. I know they were operate. Some were operating, and put traps were operating until fairly recently in the seven. But I I don't think there are any left. I'm sure there are lots of people more expert than me in this. Um, um, conversation who can contribute to that. I think, well, for, for, from what I've seen of what, I'm, what I've read, the Severn Estuary was kind of the last place yeah, yeah. up mm-hmm. until the um, late 19th century, probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know yeah. either. Um, Certainly into the photographic era. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. There's some lovely photos actually out there. Mm. Um, Jason is wondering why you call the structure a weir rather than a trap. Oh, um, I tried to be guided by the literature rather than um, rather than kind of come up with my own terminology. And, and my understanding is that a fish weir is one of these large um, structures that are basically fences, usually V-shaped, which kind of guide um, the fish into a particular catchment area. Whereas a trap, um, and I'm quite happy to be um, co- contradicted or, or contested here, is generally a kind of a basket of some kind, um, which is which is set in place and tends to be a lot smaller. So like those kind of conical put baskets that we saw in, a, in an earlier um, photograph in the presentation. So that's that's my um, understanding of the um, the difference between the two. Thank you. Um, and Jeffrey is asking if you know what the sea level would have been while the fish trap was in use compared to now, so Saxon sea level. Do you know, I don't think it could have been that much different because um, the this isn't based exactly on measurement, but but um, the at the moment the kind of you know the the time it seems to sit within the right where it is now seems to sit within the right tidal range um for catching um fish i mean if you if you reinstated all of the posts it would work very well thank you very much i mean the tide would come in wash around and come back out and it would it would more or less work so if there are differences it must be quite fine it, you know, I, I I couldn't give I couldn't put a number on it, but I don't think it's a really really significant difference. More to do, as you say. Um, more more to do, yes. <laughs> Pauline is asking if there are, are still posts in place to do some drone photogrammetry. Oh, um, good luck with that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. Go go back and go and go and have a look at the site and see. Um, when we went back in 2016 it was really quite hard to see the outline of the i mean the, when we went there in 2005 it was immediately visible once we once we had enough time to to look when we went back um the, the problem the problem with it is you have the posts which look like black lumps like this and then you have all these kind of clusters of, of stuck together kind of mussel shells that that go around and they're kind of black lumps that look just like this as well so what you end up with is a surface of lots and lots of black lumps some of which are the tops of posts and some of which are um some of which are other features so i don't think the drone photogrammetry please correct me please do it and prove me wrong but i don't really think it's it would be the most productive approach I know from our experience out with um, Chichester and District Archaeological Society, the plan was to do a photographic, a photogrammetric model from on the ground, but even the littlest bit of water um, really meant that it was impossible, and that was at a quite a low tide. So I think it is very tricky, even you know, right up close to it. Yeah, I mean, I wonder as, as well what I mean. It would be, I mean, you could do the whole the whole landscape, um, and then do a do a more conventional kind of. Um, 
you know, survey taking the points on the top of every post and then superimposing one onto the other. And then you get an understanding of how the how the structure fitted within fits today within the wider landscape. I can see the usefulness of that very much so, but um, <coughs> actually just the site itself, I, I don't really see what information that that would um, yield very um, productively or helpfully that just using a total station would, am I old fashioned, would um, would would yield, yeah. Get out there with your tapes and pencils. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, a question from Steve, uh, we, sorry we've got quite a few questions if you don't mind. Um, I'm quite happy, uh, yeah. Yeah, excellent John, thank you. So this question from Steve, I've seen similar structures at Bradwell on Sea and Tolsbury, both on the River Blackwater. Do you know if these are um, from a similar period design? Or do you have any the, the Blackwater estuary, if they are the ones that are part of the Blackwater survey, that's probably the biggest collection of, of, um, of Saxon fish weirs anywhere in the country. As I say, this is the one with about the 13,000 posts or something that some poor soul um, surveyed so maybe that would have been better done with a drone um, but yeah that is a, that is probably the biggest and there's quite a lot of published literature on that, that if you want to sort of investigate that further. And I know some of those references are in your publication. From yes that. yes the, the Which... difference between the difference with those on, on Blackwater estuary um, and elsewhere is rather than having this round pound they had a kind of a funnel at the end some kind of you know running into some kind of conical basket or, or some kind of structure like that at the end rather than a round pound. And Elroy, who um, I think is coming to us from the United States, actually, um, is wondering what types of fish did they weir trap? Now, you did mention this before. So he says that, for example, on the um, BC coast, I'm not sure, fish weirs primarily caught salmon and herring. Um, I know you mentioned this in your talk. I, 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 to be honest, um, this, is, this is a really, really shameful gap in my knowledge, what exactly they were catching in those um, Weirs, so I hope maybe there's somebody else in the room can um, maybe just type in a list of, of common fish to have been caught. I wouldn't have thought salmon. I would have thought these were um, fish that were coming. Um, can we have local fish um, coming to kind of forage in the um, in the Ashlet um, in the Ashlet kind of inlet creek area, and then just being caught on the way out. Flat fish. I don't know. Help. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. There is there is a publication I came across recently that you know shows you fish off the British waters where it's this goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I'd, I'd I'd love to know a lot more about this. What exactly they're catching and um, yeah, maybe that's as I say a, a reconstruction would be fun. <laughs> and David, thank you very much for coming back to us. So David asked a question at the very beginning, and um, he says that you mentioned a broader weir survey from the region just after the first slide of. The presentation um, and David's. Ah, question. no, I, no, no. I think what I, what I was saying was that actually this wasn't part of a. We we weren't part of doing a kind of an intertidal survey. We were, you know, we were we 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 went onto the that area of the the of the, um, of the foreshore looking for what we hoped would be a, a Sunderland flying boat or the remnants thereof, which somebody had told us was to be found in the area. And, and it was during that search for that thing that um, that we just stumbled across this fish weir. Fortuitously. Fortuitously. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, hi, Jack. Uh, Jack is wondering if there is, uh, sorry, if there's lots of evidence for other coastal sites of a similar date um, along that immediate stretch of coastline. No, not as far as I can tell. I mean, apart from, I mean, on the other side, as, as we've said, that there, there are those two weirs, one directly contemporary at Binstead and one slightly later just along the coast. Um, but apart from that, I'm not aware of, if we're, if we're talking about Saxon intertidal material, I'm not aware of anything else. But again, um, I'm quite happy for, I mean, this is not my normal area of operation. So yeah. um I'm quite happy for people with a lot more expertise about Hampshire archaeology to um, step in and, and offer any information they have. Um, Anthony is asking, um, does the expansion of salt marsh, so, excuse me, if does the expansion of salt marsh between Saxon period and the 19th century tally with the wider geoarchaeological geo -archaeological and ecological record for Southampton Water? Um, yes, and and also I think for for a lot of kind of Northwest Europe as well, 
Um, that I can't remember the reference off the top of my head, but there is a there has been work done on this, and there is a reference in the article um, talking about these patterns of of kind of expansion since the uh, sort of since the Saxon period during the medieval period, um, and then this fairly consistent pattern of retreat seen since since the 19th century around southwest England in the Netherlands, etc. So it's it kind of fits within a wider a wider pattern. And Roger, and I know Roger, you were in touch with me uh, one of these days asking this question, and I wasn't very helpful because I didn't have the information to hand. But uh, Roger is wondering if your bibliography includes references to work in the River Blackwater. Um, I think yes, it certainly does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. It is, that's one of the most important sites in the country in terms of Saxon fishweirs. So that's been quite well published. And I think you can just, if you just Google that um, Saxon fish weir and invaded fish trap, you can get the, the paper quite easily. It's not the, something the, that you have. The paper's open access, I believe. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, sorry. Um, and Steve, uh, hi again, Steve. He is uh, wondering if they are, if these features come associated with salt working sites. Well, there there is evidence of salt working sites around um, the Ashlet Creek area, um, but they're not dated. So there is evidence, but whether it's contemporary evidence or not, we don't we don't know. But it would certainly help in terms of um, onward, onward trade of, of fish. And Jack's just come back to say that there are some post features on the coast around the New Forest at Calshot and Thorns Bay, but uh, they think that he thinks that these are older and the MAT um, have some data on these. I don't know, Jack, if these are the kind of trackway feature or thought to be a trackway feature, which the MAT have looked at recently. Um, again, that's probably one for the for the trust. Uh, and uh, Peter asks, did you find the flying boat? No, we were. That was it. I have to say, um, when the two of us traipsed back from the from the um, salt marsh with the with this with the light fading and told our um, colleagues that we hadn't found a flying boat, but we had found a, a row of stumps sticking out of the mud. Um, it didn't really go down very well. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it all looked it all looked a bit better in the in the full light of day when we went back and 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 saw what we saw. So yeah. <laughs> And Marcus, thank you very much. You've come with a piece of information just to say that there um, are some weirs still active in the Severin um, region oh. and right up until a few years ago, and there was stone built. So that's um, uh -huh. really nice to see some of these. Um, sorry, I, a question is still pouring in. Um, this is really good. Uh, and Lara, one colleague, Lara, hello, Lara. Um, she is saying that there, um, she thinks that there are still some stone fish weirs in use in Somerset. So these might be uh, very similar to the ones that Marcus mentioned. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I'm just going through this right. list of questions. Um, so uh, Angela, hi, Angela. Angela has several questions. So does the level of spire points mark the base of longish term exposure? Um, so the piles around that level have gradually eroded, now being sawn off, so indicate a low tide horizon. I'm not quite. I'm not sure I understand. What was what was interesting was that um, the posts were um, really, really. I mean, some of them were, as I say, some kind of that far in. Um, some of them were almost kind of popping out. Even you know they would have disappeared on the next tide. And then that first post I showed you, they were you know they were more than a meter in. So and and they were posts on the same the same line, if you like, or within the same core structure. So really, what the, it was quite hard to work out what the exact or even approximately what what was going on. I mean, why were some of them so deep and some of them not? Maybe some of them was later replacement posts where they didn't drive them in so thoroughly and just tied them to the adjacent ones which were in deeper. I, I, I don't know what was going on there. It would be, I mean, it would be very, very interesting to get a kind of depth profile of all the posts, but that's a big job. And certainly yeah, that presumably they, they were repaired over over time. And yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you have greetings from Darina. Uh, greetings, Hi, John. Hi, Darina. Uh, there are a few, few uh, sorry, a few V-shaped weirs in use on the Waterford estuary in Ireland plus um, a few odd shapes at Bat, oh, sorry, Bal on the Tray on the Munster Blackwater. I don't know if you're cool. familiar with these ones, John. No, and um, they're, they're still in operation today? 
Uh, I don't know, Darina, can you come back and uh, tell us that? Um, the only place um, I've seen them still in operation is Tanzania. Oh, and Egypt as well. Um, but um, yeah, I'd like to see some closer to home. Not quite as muddy, I imagine, as uh, Southampton. Well, warm, warm mud where there is some. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. We did have a lot of other nice comments. Um, thank you. Uh, which I will pass on to you. And I think we will gonna leave it there. John, thanks a million for taking the time to join us. My I pleasure, thank you for inviting me. So thank you everybody. Thanks a million, John. Uh, we thank hope you. to see you all soon. And uh, in the meantime, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye.